Uh, I'm going to be discussing imaging conical intersection and photodissociation dynamics using ultra-fast electron diffraction. So, uh, what has been done? Well, Yang and his group have directly imaged the conical intersection dynamics and photodissociation dynamics of the CF3I molecules in the gas phase during ultra-fast gas phase using ultra-fast gas phase electron diffraction. Uh, this has allowed them to map out the real space trajectories of the nuclear wave packets through the ultra-fast chemical process, and they observed the bifurcation of these wave packets through the conical intersections. Previous experiments have shown evidence for the non-adiabatic coupling through these conical intersections, but they've never been observed in real time due to the insufficient spatio-temporal resolution available. Uh, the team have managed to produce what's known as a molecular movie for the CF3 fragment after the photodissociation, where the nuclear positions were measured in real time. Uh, they've shown that ultra-fast gas phase electron diffraction can measure molecular structure after photo excitation of molecules in exquisite detail, um, even to an error of 0 0.01 angstroms for the bond length and one degree for the bond angle. Uh, these studies, these findings have uh, set a standard for ab initio uh, non adiabatic dynamic calculations. One of the biggest challenges in chemistry is to observe atomic motions during ultra-fast chemical processes, such as photodissociation and bifurcation through conical intersections. Conical intersections play a critical role in excited state dynamics as they govern reaction pathways of many non-adiabatic processes. They allow for radiationless transitions between electronic states which have different configurations of the nuclei and they typically occur on femtosecond timescales. Conical intersections arise from degeneracies of the potential en energy surfaces. Uh, this leads to the breakdown of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, as the non-adiabatic coupling terms tend to infinity as the difference in electric potential energies becomes very small. Uh, there is no longer a separation in the timescales between the electronic and the nuclear degrees of freedom, and the wave function can no longer be factored into electronic and nuclear terms. There are a wide variety of computational methods that have been used to observe the dynamics through conical intersections. For small systems, we can treat the non-adiabatic process like conical intersections with exact full quantum dynamics and the time-dependent Hartree approximation. For larger systems, we can use semi-classically motivated techniques such as um, Tully's surface hopping, Meyer-Miller formalism, and ab initio uh, multiple spawning, or AIMS. Uh, the latter was used to verify the experimental observations seen by Yang. Um, even relatively small systems require some non-trivial approximations to be made in the simulations, so that's why it's crucial for us to verify the verify it with uh, experimental observations. This research was done at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Centre, or SLAC, and they've been generating beams of electrons to study some important laws of nature. In the past, they've used these powerful beams for uh, powerful particle collisions that revealed fundamental building blocks of matter. They also use these electrons to generate X-rays as the electrons are bent by magnets. But recently, they have been using electrons for ultra-fast electron diffraction to probe the inside of materials. Spectroscopic methods measure changes in the energies of molecules as they undergo reactions, but ultra-fast diffraction can give complementary information, such as the structure of the short-lived intermediate states in a reaction which can otherwise not be measured. It starts with the production of a high-quality beam of very energetic electrons, with energies in the scale of mega electron volts. This is done inside an electron gun, uh, where the laser pulse evaporates electrons from the metal surface known as a photocathode. The short bunch of electrodes, electrons is accelerated by radio frequency field towards the exit of the gun, where a magnet focuses the consecutive bunches into a narrow beam of electrons travelling near the speed of light. They then shine this beam through a sample, and the electrons scatter off of the sample and produce a diffraction pattern. 
This allows for probing into a material structure and can be, and can be used to observe ultra-fast changes in the structure that occur in less than 100 femtoseconds, for example, in response to a photo excitation. Ultra-fast electron diffraction has been used with condensed matter to see ultra-fast processes to femtosecond resolution, but it's harder to do with gas phase samples. Gas electron diffraction has been a standard technique for measuring static structures of isolated materials since 1930. Gas electron diffraction is so important because we live in a gas environment, so it's important to know how light, such as sunlight, interacts with gases in our atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide. From a technology view, a gas is easier to test than condensed system, as, the gas is, as a gas is much more isolated and it's easier to simulate models to compare with results. The challenge that's associated with gas electron diffraction is the weak signal that it, it produces. In condensed systems, electrons are interacting with a sample with a density of 10 to the 23 molecules per centimetre cubed. In the gas, there are only about 10 to the 17, so the signal is much weaker. The main advantage is it provides sub-angstrom spatial resolution in a very compact setup. It uses a continuous beam of electrons with a kinetic energy in the range of 10 to 100 kilo electron volts, and it's crossed with a molecular beam in a vacuum chamber. The scattering pattern is recorded in 2D on a 2D imaging detector like a photographic plate. The interference of the waves results in a circular rings for the diffraction pattern, and the random orientation of the molecules means the pattern only contains information in one dimension, such as the distances between the atom pairs. Uh, since it's only projected in one dimension, the distances can often overlap. If molecules have a few atoms, then this technique doesn't give enough information to determine the structure alone, and it must be compared with simulations using models. It's easier to determine, them, to determine the structure when the molecules are aligned with, with one another, and when the alignment is near perfect, the patterns can yield information on the structure in two or three dimensions where overlapped peaks in one dimension can be separated. So this is the experimental setup um, used for the work done by Yang. Uh, you see there's an initial UV laser pulse to excite the ground state gas molecules, and this excites the molecules from the ground state through two excitation channels. One is from a single photon absorption and the other from a two photon. This is then followed by an electron uh, electron probe pulse uh, to probe the molecules. Um, the data was extracted from the diffraction pattern by a Fourier transform and then an Abel inversion. This gives you a pair distribution function showing the distances between the atom pairs and the angular distribution. It is essential for assigning the reaction channels and for determining the transient structures. There are four factors which determine the temporal resolution in ultra-fast gas phase electron diffraction experiments. Uh, the first is the duration of the laser pulse which is used to excite the molecules. The second is the duration of the probing electron pulses. The third is the group velocity mismatch between the electron and laser pulses. And lastly, the time of arrival jitter between the electron and laser pulses. Uh, these days, um, the duration of the laser pulse is not a limiting factor in the temporal resolution because laser pulses of less than 50 femtoseconds are pretty standard. The duration of the electron pulses on target is determined by the duration at, of the light which causes the emission, the initial spread of the electron pulse's energy, and the spreading of the electrons as they travel, as they travel due to Coulomb force, and also the space charge effect which is when the electrons emitted from the photocathode form a negative cloud around the metal surface, which limits further emissions. These effects can be limited by using a high extraction field on the photocathode and placing the gas sample closer to the photocathode. This has managed to improve um, this temporal resolution for condensed matter systems, but it isn't as easy for gas phase systems. A high extraction field requires a high vacuum, which doesn't really work when there's a gas source at a short distance from the photocathode. A short propagation distance also does not solve the problem of the group velocity mismatch, which does tend to be the limiting factor. Um, the group velocity mismatch is due to the difference in time it takes for the electron and laser pulses to travel through the system, 
and it depends on the speed of the electrons, size of the beams, and the angle between the electron and laser beams. For condensed systems, the group velocity mismatch is negligible because the sample, sample width can be made so small. When the electrons are non-relativistic, the time delay between the pump pulse and the electron probe pulse changes a lot when travelling through the system. This effect can be having electrons travelling closer to the speed of light, as seen in this animation. Um, and the electrons can be made to be travelling closer to the speed of light by having a higher extractor field or a longer acceleration length. The problem in practice is you have to compromise between having a high extraction field and a short distance between the sample and the photocathode, as the shortest distance is required is the shortest distance is limited by the requirement of a high vacuum for the extraction field. By using a radio frequency photoelectron gun with an accelerator, the electrons can travel at around ninety nine point three percent the speed of light and this would render the group velocity mismatch, mismatch negligible. This will also reduce the space charge effect and the pulse broadening is reduced. A disadvantage is mega electron volt guns are more expensive than kilo electron volt ones, and they also require significant radiation shielding. The resolution in these pump probe experiments will be limited by the jitter between the electrons and the laser. This can be solved using time stamping techniques similar to those used for X-ray free electron lasers and for condensed matter systems in ultrafast electron diffraction. Returning to the work completed by Yang, um, the one photon channel preferentially excites the molecules with the carbon iodine bond aligned along the polarization of the axis, which is shown with the white double headed arrow in the top right image. Uh, the other double-headed arrows in this image are shows the distances between the atom pairs. Uh, we see that the distances between the carbon and iodine and the fluorine and iodine appear in the pair distribution function which is parallel to this polarization axis and the distances between the carbon and fluorine and the fluorine and fluorine are in the perpendicular pair distribution function. If we look at the photo dissociation in the one photon channel we see that the molecule is excited to the 3q0 state and it will travel along this curve until dissociation. Some other experiments have shown uh, some crossing into this 1q1 state, but this was not observed in the data collected by Yang. The most obvious experimental data to back up this up is shown on the right, where you can see the negative change in the parallel pair distribution function for the carbon iodine and the fluorine iodine bonds. The time delay is due to the differences in mass, as the heavier fluorine and iodine molecules move in a slower time scale than carbon. Um, by comparison with the Ames simulation, this time delay is within reasonable agreement. Using information from the perpendicular pair distribution function, the team was able to construct a molecular movie showing the, structure, the full structural changes after photo, photo dissociation. We can see the um, fluorine-carbon-fluorine -fluorine angle immediately opens up, followed by the CF bonds lengthening with a time delay between them. This is also seen in the AIM simulations. Now for the two-photon excitation channel. The two-photon excitation to this 7S Rydberg state has been studied by many other groups using pump probe photoelectron and photoion spectroscopy. This is told as the decay time scales and the anisotropy of the CF3 fragment but it's not told us the exact reaction pathway. And these groups were even unsure if this ion pair state, shown in red in the top left, was even involved. The two photon excitation channel prefers to excite molecules with their carbon iodine bond perpendicular to the laser polarization. From the results, we see that after a specific time delay, the carbon iodine bond becomes vibrationally excited. Uh, and it's vibrates with the period matching the period seen in previous experiments for the 7S state, showing that the molecule is definitely excited to the 7S Redberg state. The image on the right shows the simulated nuclear wave packet along the carbon iodine coordinate. The colour coding shows the diabatic state character. Um, we can see that it was initially excited to the 7S state, shown in yellow, 
and it oscillates along this curve, um, turning at the point labeled 3 in the top left image. Um, we see that the intensity decreases as there's bifurcation occurring to the ion pair state. The colour mixing shows the population splitting at these conical intersections, with the orange showing the bifurcation between the 7s and the ion pair state, and the magenta shows the bifurcation between the 6s and the ion pair state. There's some complicated analysis for the experimental data, but comparison with this simulation has shown that we've seen the real space wave package trajectories for the non-adiabatic process through the conical intersection. The ability for gas phase scattering experiments to describe the distributions of internuclear distances is limited by the random orientation of the molecules in the gas. The simplest way of aligning molecules is to use a non-resonant laser pulse to create an uh, induced dipole in these non-polar molecules. The First, the molecules are cooled by a jet-free expansion, so the rotational temperature is low. And then a strong laser field aligns the molecules along the polarization axis. This can lead to information on the transient molecular structures through chemical processes without comparison to models. And the diffraction pattern is bright spots, which show the internuclear distances and not rings. So with two laser pulses, one to align the molecule and one to trigger the photochemical process, we can observe the dynamics of the photo-excited molecules. The advantages of this would be that we can achieve atomic resolution with no input from the theory, but the disadvantages would be the complications from multi-photon ionizations due to the intensity of the alignment laser, meaning the nature of the excited state can be altered. These issues increase for larger molecules that require larger alignment fields and have more photoionization possibilities. Uh, the issue is still is that the laser alignment only lasts for a limited amount of time and molecules quickly dephase after the laser pulse is removed. There's also been progress in different methods for determining the structure of gas phase molecules with femtosecond resolution. One method is laser induced electron diffraction, where a femtosecond laser ionizes the molecule and accelerates the electron back towards the ionized molecule. The disadvantage of this, however, would be the molecules would be in a strong laser field while being probed, so the reaction pathway could be altered. Another method which would mean it, which would solve the group velocity mismatch problem and allow for high temporal resolution in gas phase electron diffraction is by using femtosecond X-ray pulses from a free electron laser. Uh, but, electron, but atomic resolution was not possible due to the much weaker scattering of X-rays compared to electrons, as the X-rays only scatter off electrons and not nuclei as well. Yang and his team are part of the growing groups of researchers who are proving ultra-fast gas phase electron diffraction is well positioned to see real-time trajectories with ultra-fast reactions in small systems. While the development of sufficiently bright electron sources to literally light up the atomic motions in a single shot using the smallest amount of sample possible solved many problems and was viewed as the turning point that enabled atomically resolved dynamics, further research into even brighter electron sources will be required to view transient structures of larger, more complex molecules such as proteins. Also, in order to see the 3D structure of large molecules, work will have to be done to align these molecules. This research is essential for our understanding of many key processes. Photoexcitation reactions occur in many areas of life, for example in nature, in photosynthesis, and also in our eyes when we convert light to electrical signals. It's also important to understand these processes from a technology point of view, for use, of, for use in solar cells for example, to generate clean renewable energy, which is becoming more relevant as the days go on. We can also aim to replace many processes which involve X-rays of electrons, as they can be applied more easily to bioscience research as electrons cause much less radiation damage than X-rays do.